Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Jennifer Tobin. I'm in the Department of Classics and Mediterranean Studies at the University of Illinois in Chicago, and I'm an archeologist. And today I'm going to talk to you about one set of amazing buildings, the Great Pyramids at Giza, that by now are about 4,500 years old and have weathered um, many historical realities, many interpretive realities and interpretive nonsense. Uh, and what we'll do today is look at um, the history of these buildings, why they were constructed, how they functioned, and how they've been interpreted over time. And I will try to solve some of the great mysteries of these buildings. Uh, some have been solved, some have not new mysteries are actually arising even as we speak. So let's talk about the Great Pyramids at Giza. To begin with, we need to understand the Egyptian idea about death. And this is a very complex topic. It's one that uh, has warranted lots of scholarship. And it's one that we don't really understand fully. But to begin with, we know that the Egyptians had a very complex notion about the soul. Now, many societies today see the soul as being something rather homogeneous, an aspect of yourself that, that is uh, separated from you at death. Well, for the Egyptians, the soul was much more varied. There were actually several aspects of the soul, each having its own identity. And for our purposes, the three we will speak about today are the Ka and the Ba, and then we'll speak about the Ak. Now the Ka was an aspect of the soul, according to Egyptian belief, that was with you when you were born. It was sort of your second self. And in fact, when you dreamed, your Ka went abroad in the world. When you died, your Ka was separated from your body, but needed to continue to return to your body. And this is true of another part of your soul in Egyptian mindset, the Ba. So this explains why mummification was so important to the Egyptians. This is a whole other complex topic, but of course mummification uh, comprises the um, intervention in the decay process. And why this was important was because the Ka and the Ba returned to the body after death. They also traveled abroad into the afterlife, but they were continually attached to the body and attached to the tomb. Therefore, the tomb was very important because it protected the body. Now in the Old Kingdom, and this is the period of time in which the pyramids were built and the peri period of time we're speaking about, roughly 2700 to 2200 BCE. During this time period, the, the uh, upper class Egyptians built tombs that today scholars call mastaba tombs because they resembled a bench and mastaba is the Arabic word for bench. These mastaba tombs sat over a grave shaft in which the body was stored. And when you see in this diagram, you can see down here is where the body uh, of the deceased was placed and a shaft led up to the mastaba form. Now the Egyptians were pretty sensible in all this. They realized that a body was corruptible even if uh, it was well mummified. And they feared that if the body was truly lost, the Khan the Ba had nowhere to visit. And so these mastaba tombs included statues of the deceased, usually placed in a small room called a serdab, and the statue is what scholars call a ka statue. And this was sort of a, a safety net. In case the body was totally destroyed, the ka and the ba could inhabit the body, uh, excuse me, inhabit the uh, statue. And these elements of the soul also needed sustenance uh, every day. And so the Mastaba tombs would have a chapel with an offering table where goods would be left for these spirits. Now, over time, it became typical to paint food or carve food on the walls of the tombs. But even in that magic way, the, uh, the Ka and the Ba were served. 
Now there was another aspect of the soul that's important and that is the ak. And this was a part of the soul that never returned to the tomb. It actually joined the gods in the sky. It went into a, a distant afterlife. And early on in uh, Egyptian belief, as we understand it, it was thought that only the Pharaoh had an ak, but over time, uh, the development, uh, the Egyptians developed the mindset that, that everybody had an ak. So these are important aspects that help us understand what was necessary in the grandest of tombs ever built, the pyramids, which were grand tombs of the Pharaohs. Now we also need to understand the role of the Pharaoh in all this. So in the old kingdom, the Pharaoh was supremely powerful. He exacted all control over all aspects of Egypt and he was considered a God. He was the son of uh, the sun God, Re or Ra. And during this period, that was one of the most important gods of the Egyptian pantheon, the sun God, we'll, we'll speak much more about him today. Uh, he was the embodiment of the god Horus, who was a falcon god. And his ka was believed to actually nourish and support the people of Egypt, which was one reason why he uh, had so much loyalty. And as we'll see, one reason why people were uh, willing to help build his pyramid. Now on his death, his ak definitely joined the gods who dwelt in the northern sky. And a very important aspect of the pyramids was helping on that journey. So let's talk a bit about pyramids. One thing that needs to be appreciated is the fact that the construction of pyramids was going on for about 150 years before the Giza pyramids were built. And it was a, an aspect of trial and error. We can see very well how pyramids developed um, we can see where mistakes were made as the architects were grappling with this remarkable form of monumental building. Now, the earliest pyramid we know of is the Pyramid of Djoser. That was built about 2668 BCE, and it began its life as a mastaba tomb. And if you can see in this diagram, the original form of this building was just a mastaba tomb. But then the architect, a man named Imhotep, uh, decided to elaborate that and place Mastabatum upon Mastabatum, making a stepped pyramid. Now, we're not sure why the pyramid form was so desirable. Some suggest it um, was a means to uh, help the soul of the Pharaoh go up into the sky uh, with these steps. Uh, others suggest that it mimicked um, the so-called mound of creation, which in Egyptian belief, they believed was the first thing that appeared when the world was made. The Egyptians believed that the world came out of a watery void and then a mound appeared and life grew on it. And so if this is a replica of the mound of creation, it is certainly symbolic of life and new life for the Pharaoh. Others have suggested the pyramid may represent rays of the sun. This is something we simply don't know. But in any case, Djoser built the first stepped pyramid and several pharaohs followed his example. The pharaoh, um, the pyramid of Huni, uh, which was built several generations later, began a new phase in pyramid design in that it was also a stepped pyramid, but the architect decided to fill in the steps to create a straight-sided pyramid. Unfortunately, this didn't work very well. You can see with this pyramid that we see a step here. This is where masonry has fallen off. And in fact, this is all fallen masonry. And so the steps were filled in, but over time, this filling has fallen away. Huni's son, a man named Snefru, built at least two pyramids. He might have even built the Pyramid of Huni, we're not sure. But it's clear that he was exploring the idea of the straight-sided pyramid. And in the first pyramid that he built, he creates a fairly sharp angled pyramid. And then midway through the construction, something seems to have gone wrong. 
and they completed the pyramid at a more gentle angle. And so you see this weird uh, kind of bend here. We call this the bench pyramid of Sneferu. And evidently that was not good enough because he went ahead and built a second pyramid that shares this same angle, but is the first true uh, successful straight-sided pyramid. And this is all leading up to the uh, pinnacle, if you can say that, the pinnacle of pyramid design, the pyramids at Giza. So these other pyramids had been built at other cemeteries uh, near Memphis, which was the ancient capital of the day. They were built at Dashur and Saqqara and elsewhere. But uh, the Pharaoh that we know as Khufu chose Giza as his burial ground. Now you might be familiar with Khufu by his Greek name, which is Cheops. And when the Greeks uh, encountered Egypt sometime in the seventh and sixth centuries BC, they began to write about the Egyptians, but they had trouble uh, with the Egyptian names. And so they kind of Hellenized these names. And so Khufu became Cheops in the Greek world. And that sometimes is what people refer to him as but let's call him by his Egyptian name, Khufu. His name means protected by Khanum, who was another god of the day. And the only image we have of this man is a four inch tall ivory figurine from, uh, from the city of Abydos. And really we know nothing biographically about this man, except he ruled for about 20 years and he constructed this great pyramid. The image shows a pharaoh seated on a throne. Over his shoulder is a fly whisk, which is an, an emblem of power. And he's wearing the uh, crown of Lower Egypt. Khufu chose Giza as his burial ground. And Giza had served as a cemetery uh, several centuries earlier, but no pyramids had ever been built there. It was close to the capital and on the west bank of the Nile. Now, in fact, all of these pyramids were on the west bank of the Nile because the Egyptians associated the west with death. It's where the sun set, where uh, light ended. And so you can see in the little black and white picture looking across the Nile at, uh, at Giza. Giza was also located in the desert just above the flood zone of the Nile, and I'll talk about that more in a minute. Today, uh, the uh, um, suburbs of Cairo are, are just nipping at the heels of the, of the pyramids. You can see in the color photograph, that dark business at the top is the suburbs of Cairo. So the Pyramid of Khufu. Uh, lots of dimensions to share with you, just to give you a, a sense of the size. As I've said, it was built probably over a 20 year period. And it's very likely that as soon as Khufu became Pharaoh, he began construction on his burial place. It originally was about 481 feet tall, and it is now 30 feet shorter because as you can see, uh, the profile of the pyramid is very rugged. And that's because originally it was coated in a very fine white limestone called Tura limestone that is quarried across the Nile from the pyramids. This limestone was so desirable that in the Middle Ages when uh, Cairo was built, they began mining and tearing off these pieces of stone to use in buildings in Cairo. The, the stone that you see here, uh, the inner stone of the pyramid is quarried right on the spot and we'll talk more about that. Now, as is famous, the building has near perfection of, uh, of orientation. It's oriented on the four cardinal points. Uh, the length of the sides is 750 feet on each side with a minimum of error of about eight inches. And uh, one, of the, one of the many statistics I can quote is that over 2 million blocks were estimated to be used in this building, the average weighing about two and a half tons. This was the largest pyramid ever constructed in Egypt. 
and it would remain one of the largest buildings in, in the world until modern times. This building also was the most complex of the pyramids ever constructed with not one, but three uh, chambers inside. Now, when scholars started studying this building, they assumed that the three different chambers represented changes in design as the pyramid was being constructed. That was one theory of why there were three chambers inside. Another theory has been that they built these chambers to trick tomb robbers. But the prevailing view now is that in fact, the three tomb chambers were all intentional and they all were designed to serve the various aspects of the soul of the Pharaoh, the Kal, the Ba, and the Ak. Now the uh, lowest one is actually subterranean and it's often referred to as the false tomb chamber, the so-called false tomb chamber. It was quarried out of bedrock and was never quite finished uh, probably because uh, it took so much work to get the bedrock up out of the, onto the, onto the earth. It also uh, cut into some fissures in the rock. Um, you can see one of my students, a uh, long time ago, I took a field trip of students to the pyramids. So you'll see them modeling throughout here. So the false tomb chamber, we're not at all certain of its function. It may have served the Ka, it may have been a symbolic place of death and resurrection as one a part of the soul goes um, out of the ground. There's also a tomb chamber that's referred to as the queen's tomb chamber. Now we know that the queens were actually buried in their own little pyramids at the foot of this pyramid. Uh, so this is not at all associated with the queen. The uh, important feature of this, this room is that it has a niche made out of very well-constructed stones that most likely held the Ka statue of the Pharaoh. And we talked about Ka statues, these statues where the Ka can live in case something happens to the body. And it's thought that the so-called queen's chamber was a simply a large space for the Ka statue of Khufu. Now, by the time scientists got into this building, everything had been removed. So if there had been a statue there, it's long gone. But the niche is a likely spot for a statue and we know cost statues in tombs are typical. Now leading up from the queen's chamber, so-called queen's chamber, is one of the uh, great treasures of this building, the so-called grand gallery, this long passageway that reaches up towards the main burial chamber of the Pharaoh. And you can see it's made of enormously carefully carved stones that uh, cant in as they go up with a, a uh, series of stones above forming a very simple vaulted archway. And as it ascends, it leads to the king's burial chamber. Now, this is an interesting structure because as you can see, it essentially is a bubble inside of this massive uh, series of stones. And the architect was very concerned that this chamber did not collapse with the weight of the stones above it. So very cleverly, the architect roofed this building with a series of large stone slabs that were um, supported by smaller stones leaving spaces in between as you see here. And therefore there was not so much weight directly on the roof of the chamber. At the very top, stones were uh, angled so as to shift weight away from the building. Now why I mention this is because nowhere in this building do we see any reference to its inhabitant except here. You can see in this diagram a few little uh, hieroglyphic inscriptions. These were left by teams of workmen and they called themselves the workers of Khufu. Some of them called themselves the drunkards of Khufu, nicknames for their teams. And they left their mark on this building, letting us know today who was buried here. Now the walls of this chamber are unusual because they are of red Aswan granite 
that uh, enormous stones were sailed down the Nile to make the walls of this built of this room. And the sarcophagus itself was also of this red granite. And this is where the Pharaoh would have been laid to rest. Now this room has one uh, more surprise to it. Uh, the so-called air shafts that reach out from it. Um, air shafts is not an accurate description of what these things are. Uh, they don't bring in any air. Uh, they're about a foot square and they reach out from uh, the king's chamber in two directions and actually also from the queen's chamber. Uh, people didn't know what this was. And at the end of the 20th century, so sometime in the 1990s, uh, scientists sent up a robot that crawled up through this, these passageways what they encountered, at least in this passageway, was a blockage with some um, metal pins, but it's clear looking at it from the other direction that it was designed to pierce the entirety of the pyramid. What scholars think this is, is a ways for the spirit of the Pharaoh to come and go. And in fact, this one, is aimed at the North Star, the place where the Pharaoh's Ak is supposed to go and be with the gods. The other one is aimed more or less towards the constellation Orion. Of course, the constellation moves through the sky during the night, but Orion was um, more or less associated with the god Osiris, the god of the dead. So clearly these are not air shafts, but they are designed to help the spirit of the Pharaoh move on to be in the afterlife. Now, this remarkable building took 20 years to construct. And when the Greeks and Romans encountered the pyramids, they claimed or they thought that the pyramids were built by slaves. Now, this could not be more, more wrong because slaves didn't even exist in this period of Egyptian history. And we know that in fact, farmers helped build this pyramid. Now, as I mentioned briefly a few minutes ago, the Nile floods every year. It, now it doesn't because of the construction of the Aswan Dam, but through much of its history, every uh, spring with the runoff from snows in the Ethiopian mountains, the uh, Nile would grow very huge and would jump its banks and uh, fill the fields on either side of the river with rich soil, water, and it would take several months for the water to recede and leave good soil for the farmers to, uh, to cultivate. Now, Egypt was really an agrarian society. Most of the population were farmers. But during the time when the Nile was in flood, the farmers had no work because they couldn't do anything with water over their fields. It's this population that was tapped to build the pyramids during a time when these men had nothing to do anyway. And so every year, farmers would come to the pyramids and do kind of the grunt work where you didn't have to be very well trained, you just needed to use your body strength to construct the pyramids. And recent excavations have uncovered the barracks right here of the, uh, of the farmers who worked periodically. And from excavation, we know that they were fairly comfortably housed. They were well fed. We know that they were fed with a lot of meat and grain. They had beer and wine. They were well treated. Now, in addition to that, there were trained workers who worked on the pyramids as stonemasons, artisans, other more trained uh, professions. They too had a village right here not too far from the uh, foot of the pyramids. And uh, there their families lived, women, children. Uh, we know that, again, they were fed very well. We have evidence of uh, granaries. We also have their cemetery. I mean, this town was in existence for over 20 years. And we can see that, yes, some people died of, of trauma, of injury, because moving big stones will do that. Some, you can see bones were set and they lived long beyond that trauma. So the idea that these were uh, created by slaves is now very clearly a, a misunderstanding. Here you can see on the left, um, the 
the uh, mud brick foundations of the uh, of the pyramid town of the of the trained workers, the uh, the farmers just lived in barracks. And this picture on the right, you can see uh, modern Egyptian workers lined up in the barracks, and then you can see grain silos that fed these people. Now the great question is, how did these men work? And uh, Egypt at the, at the time had simple tools of simply uh, copper. That was the strongest metal they had. They also did not use the wheel, but they used sledges to drag stones into position. And the prevailing theory now is that they, would be, they had built um, clay ramps that allowed stones to be dragged up and put into position. Here you can see it all going, spinning all the way around the pyramid and getting stones up to the top. Uh, in some examples of experimental archeology, span we can see that um, uh, uses of levers and such were uh, instrumental in putting the blocks into position. Now in the end, the pyramid stood not in isolation. And what we're seeing are the two later pyramids also with Khufus. But the point I wanna make is that uh, as we talked about with the Mastaba tomb, tombs needed all sorts of elements, including a place to leave offerings for the Pharaoh. And so here we have a, a typical temple, what we call the mortuary temple that was against the pyramid. Uh, very few traces survive today, but we know it existed. And this is where offerings were made for the Ka and the Ba of the Pharaoh. There was also a causeway that led to another temple by the Nile River called the Valley Temple. We have pyramids for the queens of the Pharaoh, and we have Mastaba tombs that served uh, the uh, court of the Pharaoh. When people died, they want to be buried next to their Pharaoh. More surprises though occur around this building. Um, for a long time, people knew that there were these long narrow pits that were around uh, the pyramid and they were nicknamed boat pits because they had sort of a boat-like shape. And boats were very important to Egyptians. Of course, all of their travel was by boat on the Nile. It was believed that the sun traverse the sky in a boat, and it was believed that you could travel to the gods in a boat. Well, sometime in the middle of the 20th century, one of these boat pits was uh, excavated, and lo and behold, there was an entire boat in it, dismantled, of cedar wood dating to the time of Khufu, so 4,500 years old. Uh, there was mud on the keel, so it had actually sailed in the Nile. And with great difficulty, archeologists reconstructed it. And you can see it today in a uh, little, little building next to the pyramid itself. You walk in and you can still smell the cedar wood. So this served the Pharaoh. It either brought his body to the pyramid and also perhaps served as a way for him to join the sun, to join the gods, some sort of mystical need for this boat. Well, Khufu was not the only one who built pyramids at Giza. His son, Khafre, or by his Greek name, Kephren, his name means appearing like Ray, that's the sun god, his father. Khafre also built a pyramid at Giza. And he was kind of crafty in this because his pyramid is about 10 feet shorter than his father's pyramid, but he built his pyramid on a higher rise of land. So when you look at this picture, the dominant pyramid is uh, Capres, but it's not the tallest one. It's just sitting on a higher hill. His pyramid is always distinguishable from the others because it still has some of that Torah limestone, that casing that I said was robbed off of uh, Capres, a Khufu's pyramid. And you can see it there clearly in the picture on the right. On the left, I took this photo looking just up the pyramid and you can see the casing there. So it was, took about 20 years to build. It's 10 feet shorter than his father's pyramid and it's about 50 feet shorter on each side. It also is much simpler in design. It has a single burial chamber, though it has some 
subterranean passageways associated with it as well. And here you can see the sarcophagus with one of my students goofing up uh, playing Pharaoh in it. But you can see uh, this very well-designed burial chamber. Why it's so much simpler than its predecessor, we do not know. There may have been a shift in uh, beliefs of what, what was needed by the soul. In any case, this pyramid has some interesting features. It has, again, um, pyramid for a wife or perhaps an aspect of the soul, the so-called satellite pyramid. It has a mortuary temple where offerings were made for the spirit of the Pharaoh, a long causeway leading to the valley temple. Now Khufu's valley temple did not survive, but Khafre's is a beautiful example of simple, elegant architecture in Aswan granite. You can see it there on the, uh, on the right. A simple structure where offerings were made to Khafre, Probably some of the mummification process took place in this temple. But one of the great surprises, one of the great treasures from this temple was discovered in a pit located just about in this room, under this room, where was discovered this beautiful portrait of Khafre, showing him serenely in power with his fist on his knee, showing his might, his uh, head cloth, uh, showing his state of office and a very serene expression. But what I love about this statue is when you look at it from the front, you see this hugely empowered leader. From the side, you understand the source of his power. He's being embraced by Horus, the god, the falcon god, who's literally holding his neck, protecting him, supporting him. And he is in fact believed to be the embodiment of Horus on earth. So a wonderful statement of power, but also of the importance of divinity. Now, Khafre's pyramid is chiefly uh, famous, I guess, or one of the famous aspects of it is its association with the Sphinx. Now I mentioned earlier that the pyramids besides the Torah limestone were quarried, the blocks for the pyramids were quarried locally. And in fact, the Sphinx is in one of these quarries. You can see the lines here uh, where stones have been quarried out, but a mound had been left and uh, shaped into the form of a Sphinx. Now, a Sphinx was a very specific kind of God. He was actually called Ra Harakte, Ra of the rising sun. So the Sphinx is an aspect of the sun god Ra the aspect of the God as the sun rises. And in fact, the Sphinx faces the east, faces the, the rising sun. Now the head of the Sphinx is wearing a head cloth that is worn by pharaohs. And it's believed that the Sphinx is in fact an enormous portrait of Khafre. And you can see its direct association with the pyramid of Khafre. And in later times, it's very, very standard to have pharaohs portraits put on sphinxes, much smaller sphinxes. This is the biggest we have, but it seems to be another association with uh, Khafre and the divine. Now the last of the pyramids is the smallest. It was built by Menkau Re, uh, whose name means eternal like the souls of Re. Uh, you might know him by his Greek name, Mycerinus. And he was the son of Khafre. So in fact, we have three generations here, Khufu, Khafre, and uh, Menkau Re. His pyramid is much smaller. Uh, it's uh, only about 213 feet tall, so about half the height of his predecessors. And the, the lengths of the sides are only about 335. It's not even a true square, it's kind of rectangular based. What it loses in height, it makes up in elaboration because the lowest 16 courses are faced with a red Aswan granite. Very difficult to cut, very difficult to transport. And so this is a small pyramid, but more elaborate than its predecessors. The upper sections were again of Tura limestone. And the design is rather simple with just a single burial chamber. 
but it also has a very fine array of accompanying buildings, Queen's Pyramids, a mortuary temple, causeway, and valley temple. And what I want to stress here is that we think of the pyramids as being just one thing, but it's just a piece of the whole mechanism that helped the soul of the pharaohs survive. Now in the valley temple, we once again have some marvelous portraiture that was excavated. This time it shows Menkau Re with his wife, his chief wife. Um, and it was typical amongst Egyptian royalty for brothers and sisters to intermarry. It was thought it kept the bloodline pure. These were divine beings. And so you didn't want to muddy the bloodline with mere mortals. So uh, Menkau Re is shown with his wife slash sister, a woman named Karma Renebti. And the two of them were found in the Valley Temple. And it's, I think, a beautiful portrait of uh, devotion, marital devotion with uh, Karma Renebti's hand sort of around the waist of her husband, her other hand on his arm. And again, this serene power that these beings had. So the pyramids functioned as tombs uh, and as places where the uh, pharaohs were worshiped for hundreds and hundreds of years. But over time with uh, the vagaries of history, uh, many of those elements kind of fell away. And by the time the Greeks and the Romans came to Egypt and started writing about the pyramids, they were not that familiar with how the pyramids functioned, who built them, why they were constructed. The outlying buildings no longer survived or survived in ruins. But because the Greeks and Romans um, to us today uh, are, were such a source of knowledge, it's interesting to think about what they saw in the pyramids. And in general, they thought the pyramids were examples of great waste of uh, useless buildings of these giant tombs. But Herodotus, who's the first person to write a lot about the pyramids, and he's writing in the fifth century BCE, he's a Greek. He has some really interesting things to say about the pyramids. And he says that so evil a man was Cheops, and he means Khufu, that for lack of money, he made his own daughter sit in a chamber and exact payment. How much I do not know, for they did not tell me this. He's hearing this from gods, evidently. She, they say, during her father's bidding, was minded to leave some memorial of her own and demanded of everyone who sought intercourse with her that he should give one stone to set in her work. And of these stones was built the pyramid that stands midmost of the three over against the great pyramid. Each side of it measures 150 feet. So according to Herodotus, the Pyramid of Khufu was built with the help of Khufu's daughter who was a prostitute. He ran out of money and he prostituted out his daughter to gain funds, which is a ridiculous idea. But the, the nice thing about this story is that she benefited from this herself because she made everybody with whom she had intercourse give her a stone, so she built her own small pyramid. So sort of a folklore interpretation of these pyramids. Another story also touches on the association with prostitution and the pyramids. And this comes from a man named Strabo, a geographer from the early Roman period, who is talking about the smaller pyramid of Menkau Re. And he says, they tell the fabulous story that when she, Rhodopis, a courtesan, and of course a courtesan is sort of a high paid prostitute, uh, she was bathing and an eagle snatched one of her sandals from her maid and carried it to Memphis. And while the king was administering justice in the open air, the eagle, when it arrived above his head, flung the sandal into his lap. And the king stirred both by the beautiful shape of the sandal and by the strangeness of the occurrence, sent men in all directions into the country in quest of the woman who wore the sandal. And when she was brought up to Memphis, she became the wife of the king and when she died was honored with the above mentioned tomb. So this is wonderful. This is a, a Cinderella type story uh, where this courtesan's shoe inspired the King Menkau Re 
to build a pyramid for her. And so in this, the pyramid is not of Menkaure, but it belongs to this courtesan. And so it's this pyramid here of Menkaure that in later times was thought to be of the prostitute or the courtesan. And other ancient authors say, you know, this was one of the seven wonders. One of the wonders is that it was built for a prostitute. Now in mid medieval times, there was also a weird set of interpretations of the pyramids. They were believed to be wondrous because they cast no shadow. And this is written about over and over again as a miracle that defies, uh, you know, the normal instance of, of things. And you can see in the satellite photo that there is no shadow that is projected on the earth. And in fact, several months out of the year when the sun is in a certain position, um, there is no shadow cast by these pyramids. But this was something that in medieval thought uh, was focusing on. There's also the notion that Christians promoted that these were not tombs at all, but they were built by the patriarch Joseph who uh, was uh, abducted into Egypt according to the Old Testament. He uh, served the Pharaoh and the Pharaoh had a dream that Joseph interpreted that meant that Egypt was about to go into a famine. And so Joseph built granaries and grain was saved and Egypt was saved. And from the fourth century CE onward, the Christians believed that the pyramids were Joseph's granaries. And even by the 15th century, um, travelers who came to Egypt were still echoing this idea. And we have a travel log written by Sir John Mandeville. It's actually not clear that he ever went to Egypt, but this is what he writes, that he's talking about um, buildings beyond Babylon. And that was the name of the Roman fortress near Cairo. And he says, there are the granaries of Joseph that he caused to be made uh, to keep the grains in the dear years. And they are made of stone, and they are full well made of mason's craft, of the which two be marvelously great and high, the other not so great. Each granary has a gate to enter within, a little above the earth, for the land is wasted and fallen since the great granaries were made. And he says, they be fall full of serpents within. And the above granaries have scriptures around them. And some men, this is the important point, some men say that they be sepulchers or sepulchers or tombs of great lords that were sometime. But that's not true, he says, for you may well know that tombs and sepulchers may not be made of such greatness nor such highness. Wherefore, it is not to be believed that they be tombs or sepulchers. So he denies the, the even thought that these are tombs. Now from the seventh century CE onward, Egypt had been uh, controlled by the Arabs and they too had a folk literature about the pyramids. And he says that the pyramids uh, were built in accordance with a dream where um, the stars were clashing and the king directed his astrologers to help him understand what is going on. And the result was the belief that there was an approaching deluge, a flood to overwhelm the land. So the king ordered the pyramids to be built and these predictions to be inscribed upon columns and large stones. And he placed within the pyramids his treasures and the bodies of his ancestors. He ordered the priests to deposit within the pyramids written accounts of their wisdom and acquirements in the different arts and sciences. Subterranean channels were constructed to convey to the pyramids the waters of the Nile. The passages were filled with talismans, with idols, and with the writings of the priests, containing all manner of wisdom, the names and properties of medical plants, the science of arithmetic and geometry, that they might remain as records for the benefit of those who could afterwards comprehend them. So in Islamic thought, the pyramids were the depositories of all knowledge um, and written and stored before the flood. So in their long history, these buildings have uh, become uh, imagined, reimagined by various societies as their original purpose began to uh, be lost 
to, uh, to modern knowledge. And it's really through excavations of the 19th, 20th and 21st centuries that have allowed us today to really approach an understanding of what these pyramids meant, how they functioned, their role as being the way that the pharaohs could achieve immortality, uh, the way they served these spirits of the pharaoh. And uh, many things are understood through modern uh, excavations and modern research, but there's still mysteries. We're still not 100% sure how they were constructed. We have best cases and best guesses. Uh, but there are still mysteries that are being uh, generated by these buildings. And I offer to you a study that took place just a few years ago in 2017. Scientists were tracking muons. Now muons are these um, elements that, that uh, are generated when cosmic rays hit our atmosphere and muons fall to, uh, to the through our atmosphere to the ground. Now muons uh, are absorbed by stone. And so somebody got it into their head in 2017 to measure muons as they hit the Great Pyramid of Khufu. And what they discovered was that there was a concentration of muons in a very unexpected place in a void here in the center of the pyramid and also over here. This means because muons are absorbed by stone, it means that there is no stone in that area because there was this big concentration of muons. Well, this was totally unexpected and very difficult to interpret. Some scientists think that there are um, hidden rooms within the pyramids. Uh, others think that in fact, the pyramids may not be as tightly packed of stonework in its interior. One scholar says, you shouldn't think of the pyramids as cheddar cheese, you should think of the pyramids as Swiss cheese. And he thinks that this is just normal settlement of stone. We simply do not know yet. And um, it's not possible, I think, to get into these rooms yet, if they are rooms, but certainly science will find us a way. And I think it's exciting to think that 400, 4,500 4, years after their construction, the pyramids are still offering mysteries for us to try to solve.